Hello and welcome to the Last Edit podcast with myself, Citizen Sleeve, and my fantastic friend, Silver Hawkins. Now, for those who don't know, this is a weekly film podcast where Silver and I alternate between film choices of our own and then we discuss them. Now, this week, we I decided to choose a TV movie and kind of in honor of Aruka Hawa passing away. And I actually went online, Silver, and checked this out before I uh, came on the podcast. I couldn't find any discussion about this movie, any review of this movie. It's like it didn't exist apart from the trailer and the fact you can see it somewhere. So I thought, I thought that was quite odd. But this, this is a TV film that was made in 1987. It was directed by Jack Gold and it was produced in conjunction with ITN in the UK and CBS in America. And it's called Escape from Soberball. It stars Alan Arkin, it stars Rucka Hauer, uh, Joanna Pakula, who are the principals uh, among other characters. And it's basically a look at the, the real life escape attempt of 600 Jews from the Nazi death camp in Soberball. So for those who don't know at the time, uh, Nazi Germany, obviously, was sending Jews en masse to death camps like Treblinka and Auschwitz. And Soberbor was the only successful escape attempt during the entire war from a death camp. Uh, no, it was not. Uh, really? Yeah, there was a mass escape from Tr- Treblinka as well. Oh, Treblinka. The, the first then, I guess, Soberbor. Or Treblinka first. I think, I mean, they even mention in the movie that there's been an escape from, from Treblinka, I think, and that they might... Yeah, but, to, not, um... but not on the same scale. Because it no, was I mean, 300 there... who escaped this one, wasn't it? No, there, there were hundreds who escaped uh, Treblinka as well, though not as many who, I think, who, like, ultimately escaped, weren't caught afterwards. Um... Yeah, and survived beyond that, okay. So there were this some. is So this is a film I watched long, long ago when I was studying Holocaust on film, and it's never come across my path again, really. And I just thought it'd be an interesting look at a different character that Howard played um, in amongst all his great and wonderful unique characters. And this was one of my first introductions to Soberbore and the story of Soberbore. And it's a very much a film of two distinct halves, kind of, which we'll talk about in a bit. So first of all, had you ever seen it before? Had you ever come across it? And what were, what were your thoughts overall? No, I'd never seen it before and I had never come across it. Um, I had never really heard of it before. Um, yeah, I, I liked it. Um, like it's a, it's a typical Holocaust movie, um, more or less, uh, like pretty much follows the standard trajectory of that type of film. Um, like from Schindler's List, uh, Jacob the Liar, Life is Beautiful, like that type of movie. Mm. Um. Like there are some it deals with some really horrific stuff. Um, there are some really effective scenes in it. Mm. Um, some stuff that works really well. Some stuff that works less well. Like I wasn't super enamored with like the the German uh, performances, like the German accents and stuff. Um, mm, yeah, yeah. That was a bit much at times. Um, but but yeah, I mean, in terms of the story, it wanted to tell and the authenticity. The authentic feeling of it, I think it, it delivered really well and um, it built it up really well. Like there's, I mean, I think to me the most effective scene in the movie was when, um, like because they have they have the arrival in the very start of the movie where yeah on the train where a contingent of Jews arrive at at Subibor and are welcomed with you know concert music and and stuff from a gramophone player um, mm. like classical music. Uh, and this, of course, is to lull them into a false sense of security so that they will not fight uh, going into the gas chambers. Um, because, of course, there are many, many more Jews than there are security guards or or SS men um, at the camp. Uh, so they need to need, need to keep them as docile as possible. Hmm. And so there's um, one of the Jews uh, gets separated from his wife and his child uh, who yeah. sort of get get jostled off to the baths and he gets uh, the job as shoemaker, uh, as a cobbler. And um, and then he's told, basically, that, that is, he, will, he will never see his wife and child again, that they've been killed by the Nazis. Um, and that scene where he realizes it is, is really effective. Uh, I think it, it is the most effective movie in the, uh, moment in the movie to me. Um, it's all the one that really, really sticks is. out from the, from the film. Um, uh, I mean, acting performances in general are are pretty solid. Like Alan Arkin, always good. Uh, yeah. Rutger Hauer, quite good as well um, as the 
as the Soviet soldier who arrives in, in the camp later on. Uh, yeah, I, I liked it a lot. Uh, I would recommend people watch it, um, especially because it's also, I mean, there are also now documentaries uh, that have been made um, following like the anniversaries of, of the escape from, from Soviet war and so forth with, with testimonies from testimonials from, from survivors. Um, and, and I think this movie fits in really well with, with that. Uh, and I would recommend watching it. Yeah, I, I very much feel the same. Um, obviously, I'd seen it before a few times when I studied it long ago. And one thing that stands out for me is the, they capture the, the true bleakness of, of you know, a, a Nazi death camp. In that, that first half in particular, it's quite heartaching at times. Not just the, the moment you mentioned with the, the cobbler, who has to be held by Leon, who is played by Alan Arkin, and another, um, another um, Jew inmate, um, to, to not scream out and not be too loud. So he just has to cry and he's just held so tightly because yeah. he just found out his life is destroyed. And, and yeah, so we should, should say that, so at the start that, you know, all these Jews are being en masse um, trained into, into the camp and all the Jews are there to, to meet them and to take their things away. And that they know what's going to happen. They know the consequences of arriving at this camp. And the, uh, do you remember there was a, a, a quite a well-dressed woman who was tipping people? Yeah. And and she just was so unaware of what was going on. Yes, she was just on this coming. journey. Yeah. yeah, and she was tipping people as if they were train assistants for real. Just so completely... Um, I just didn't see the situation that was going on ahead of her at, at all. I had no conception of what was happening. Uh, and then, the, the obviously, the SS guards, the Nazi guards, are splitting people off and, and trying to find people who have trades because they want boots made. For, and they yeah, want, I mean, it's, they want... it's, it, in addition to being an extermination camp, it is also a labour camp slave labor exactly and, and and that's quite you know distressing when you when you know the, the history of the holocaust and you see these families being divided there was the one brother who um has to try and cajole the soldiers into allowing his other brother to, to help him in his trade and uh, and the, the the other older jews are going around telling the women say that you're a seamstress say that you can sew or something that you can do something because they know the consequences if they don't have a trade yeah. or something they can offer the Nazis. One thing I find really, really interesting is the way that the, the smoke plume from the, you know, from the death chambers, from the shower, is constantly in the background of a lot of shots. This ominous thing that overshadows the whole camp, overshadows yeah, the, the Jews furnace. that are there from the furnace. And it, everyone who arrives new sees this thing and becomes aware of it. And, and it takes us a little while to get there. Because the characters all kind of bed in, are placed in the positions that they, they should want to be placed in by the Nazis, whether it's a seamstress or I think um, Luca ends up being taken away from that and looking after the livestock of the chickens and stuff. And the one boy, I think a Nazi officer wants uh, some boots made, or the end of a hilt of a sword made, or changed or something in, in you know, respect to his, um, his own house coat of arms or something fancy. And a boy is sent to get something and comes across the furnace and just sees this queue, this mass queue of naked Jews trembling and no one is coming out the other side. And, yeah. you know, it, it, they already know, but to see it physically in front of them, the impact is immediate. And, and that was one of my most impactful moments of the, of the entire film, along with the cobbler's loss of his wife or the learning of the knowledge of the loss of his wife and child. I thought that was really quite intense. And there are some moments like that throughout the film. I agree with you. I don't think the German officers are portrayed wonderfully well. The accents aren't great. Um, some, of the, some of the puppets are okay. There's, there's the one guy who, at the start, is the one who is leading them and choosing the jobs. And he's quite a bastard throughout it, as most of them are. You know, they are Nazis. Yeah. And they, ha they have that moment with the the boy in the office uh, who, who they just belittle and send away and, and, and slowly but surely you see that the true hateful nature of them become more and more and more obvious throughout the film. I, it's a film that changes quite drastically though from the initial half which is really all about the arrivals. It kind of, and... it kind of switch, shifts between being like a, a traditional Holocaust movie early on and then it sort of shifts to The Great Escape. Exactly, yeah, um, exactly right. Is the, those are the sort of tonal 
shifts in in the film. Well, we yeah, we start seeing like there's been planned escapes before. There's those two people who try two Jews who try to cut the wire, and yeah, right at the start of the movie, about the start, and they do not get very far. Obviously, there's landmines outside. There's guards who are posted on towers to snipe and or, um, um, to shoot down automatic weapons at them, and. It's then you start a little bit further in. Alan Arkin is that oh, it's almost the the, the head, or the, or the most respected of, of of the Jews in in the community, and he's the one who is trying to formulate this plan to escape to get out, and bring in other people in who he knows can help, like the cobbler, like other people who have arrived in their dif- different skill sets, and they have an idea, they have various plans, but it's not really until Rutger Hauer's character um, Sasha shows up. Um, Soviet, as you said, Jew, that the plan really kicks into gear and starts being taken seriously and comes to fruition. And yeah, it is a bit like The Great Escape. You know, there's different characters who are doing different things and bringing things and they're trying to find guns and they're trying to arrange where the gods will be so they can isolate them and take the most important ones down. Yeah. And the pace quickens up then. And it does become very much an escape movie. And it moves quite a nice pace as well. But again... All the build-up and, and his semi-love affair with Luca, which isn't really because he has a wife, as he, he says in that scene, but she still kisses him, and there's that there's these tender moments between them. But he wants to be go, go back to his family. He still be, believes they're alive, which is highly unlikely. And I don't. Yeah, but I don't he still has. I mean, it's evident he has feelings for her. All the oh, same. absolutely, absolutely, and also the the cobbler who, of course, is told that his wife and child are dead makes a friend in another female Jew who becomes. Um, a bit of a soulmate in there. They don't fall in love or anything, but they're very, very close. Um, because she's the one of the ones who consoles him, I think, when he first learns of his, his wife's death. And, yeah, it's... And there's it's, the the young, like, the older of the brothers who um, who starts uh, an affair or, or romance or whatever with, with an older woman in the camp. Um, yeah, yeah, oh, that dance. They have this dance, don't they, where they're forced to dance, basically. And he's quite forward with her. And says, you're the one I want. And she's like, whoa, whoa, maybe we'll see. We'll see what's happening there. Uh, and it, this, the, I think a film like that needs this. It needs those tender moments, those sparks of light in between the absolute horrifying situation that, that these people find themselves in. Yeah. Just to give it a little bit more gravitas and hope. Even though, quite frankly, during the Holocaust, there was very little hope for obvious reasons. But then it builds and builds and builds and, and the pace quickens and we start getting all these different people interacting. Um... There are people... I'm going to have to check this and make sure I read it correctly. There... Ah, here we go. The Oberkapos. So there are Jews who are selected by the SS to be in between disciplinarians and to discipline the Jews on behalf of the SS, make them work, make them do things that yeah, the SS want. Like, like they did in the ghettos, basically, with the Santa, exactly. Com- Santa Commandos. Yeah, exactly. And and they, they have one particular Oberkapo who's a friend who can help. And... They all start working together to, to create this plan to, to escape. And everything falls kind of into place as it should. They start drawing the Nazis in. There's that really tense moment where the, the young boy is going to get the guns from the armory. Yeah. And uh, a delivery van pulls up or a delivery um, truck pulls up and they're unpacking right outside and he doesn't know what to do and he thinks he should have to hide and not. But he manages to steal those guns and take them back to Sasha. And he starts semi-arming people, and then they go off and they start killing the Nazis bit by bit. There's the guy who, that gets killed in his office, yeah. and the cobblers um, obviously kill two, and, um, and slowly but surely the SS numbers start to dwindle. But of course, they've got to get caught at some point. And when they do, all hell breaks loose. And it's, it's every person for themselves to get out of that place. Yeah. Yeah, it's... I guess it's a it's an effective movie. Um, like cinematography as well is really solid. Um, like they're editing too. Um, like there weren't any. It wasn't like it. It didn't. It 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 was on the level where you don't really notice it, which is, I think, testimony to a, a level of craftsmanship. Um, when you don't notice editing and you don't notice, like cinematography, like. Hey, that really that didn't really make sense, or oh yeah, or, in, in, like, in standard narrative did... films, you should be foreground in the narrative, and then all technical yeah. elements should render invisible, really. Yeah, uh, and and yeah, I mean the movie just it, it goes along fairly briskly. Um, 
it's really competently made. Yeah, I I enjoyed it. Well, I didn't enjoy it, but I certainly appreciated it. I think the direction reminds me a little bit of a film we've already covered, which is Pentagon Wars. It's more than adequate. It's yeah. solid. But if, if for a TV movie, it does exactly what it needs to to foreground the important elements of the film. And for this, it's characterizations and the, the narrative, obviously. And it does that really, really effectively. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's also important to note that this movie was made in 1987, um, which was a period of time where they didn't have the, the amount of knowledge that we do today. Um, and, and that this movie was made sort of for a purpose with that in mind, uh, in terms of informing... Um, well, yeah, and also it, it must have been a difficult movie to, to get made in many respects because of its initial bleakness in the subject matter um, uh, in, in 1987 in a TV movie. And it's got a pretty good cast. You know, yeah. It has, yeah. Alan Arkin, as you said, is, is always good, and he's great as Leon in this. He really, really suits that role. Um, I really think Rucker Hauer, as you said, it's not the tippy-toppiest best ever Rucker Hauer, but he's very, very good as Sasha. He's only in it for half the movie, really, but... He has a great impact when he comes in. Suddenly, everyone lifts a bit, and it feels a bit more like that escape movie. And it feels a little bit more positive, despite all the horror that's taken place prior and that we're still seeing throughout the camp. But that ending, man, it's absolutely heartbreaking. At the same time as being ever so slightly joyous, uh, you know, they've done everything they can. They've got the weapons. They're starting to kill the SS. They they get through the gates. There are Jews who are scrambling over the wide fences and being injured and trying to crawl under them. The tower yeah, some is... Some are being is, trampled, yeah. Some are being trampled and the coats are getting lost and, and the tower with the two Nazi guards is is firing down upon them and wiping out you know, rows and rows of them as they run to try and escape. Well, I mean, the, 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 the tower guards weren't Nazis. It should be, they're, they're Ukrainians. Like the Ukrainians who were working yeah. for them, yeah. And there's that one Jew, the older um, um, brother again, who is trying to take them down as best as he can on that outer fence. And then when they burst through and you see people running by, the, you know, people, they, they, their loved ones or friends, and having to make a charge for the forest. Ah, oh, it's heartbreaking. Really, yeah, really is. across the minefield and everything. Across the minefield, on top of everything else. I mean, talk about the most arduous um, journey you could ever go through to escape somewhere. It's... Ah, I mean, how so many survived, really, given the fact that there wasn't just the towers, there were still SS officers and Nazis shooting through the fences, all kinds of stuff going on, the landmines. The fact that 300 pretty much survived that event. Um, some, some escaped beyond that. and, and, and Well, and no, not 300 survived. Uh, 300 escaped. Uh, yeah, think, sorry, yeah. I think it was about yeah. 150, maybe, or so, who got away. Yeah, there was 600 in total, and 300 actually escaped. Uh, so, before. Yeah. And then, yeah, afterwards, obviously, we get the, the, the real telling through the, the text on screen of what's actually happened to a lot of the people they could find and where they are now. You know, some have moved to America, some are in different countries. Some yeah, the one, the one I found like, especially sad was, was Leon, who gets um, murdered later on uh, by, um, by anti-Semites in, uh, in Poland. Yeah, in Poland. And also Luca, who is never found. Yeah. Sasha in real life, tried to find her as best as he could and, and, and just couldn't find her. And I thought, you know, that's a real kind of heartbreaking moment just because she became... She was almost the heart of the... You know, our heart in terms of um, a character on screen. There was a few other characters, obviously, beyond that. But I think she had the most screen time and had the most influence on Sasha. And that character was played really, really well. And that, yeah, yeah. The, the ending was um, difficult. She was certainly a significant gateway for empathy. Yeah, 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 and our window to that. As if you really needed that, given the situation that you're watching anyway. True. But yeah, I, I I, totally agree. I think if you haven't seen this, I think if you are unaware of Soberbore in, um, in what was the Holocaust and everything that happened, and you want to learn more, but you want to do it in a way which isn't entirely, horrifically, truly depressing, this has moments of positivity and moments of, of hope, which are things to cling on to in these, you know, just one of the worst situations that the world has ever seen. Uh, but it's it's a good film to, to watch. The character performances are really, really good. It's well made. It's, a, as we said, there's a few moments here and there that aren't, that aren't brilliant, and mainly that, I think, is the German officers. Not the way they're particularly portrayed, but the accents aren't great. Um, 
We don't see much of them, which you can see why, but it might have been nice to have just a little bit more idea of why they are doing certain specific things within the camp. But overall, I think the film is, is, is really quite well made and, and really worth a watch. Yeah, I agree. Um, definitely recommend it. Uh, look it up. Uh, it may be a bit tricky to get a hold of, um, but I think... I mean, you should be able to find it uh, on the internet, uh, if nothing else. Um, well, uh, as I said, well, I watched it on Prime. I don't know where you watched it, um, but the copy transfer wasn't brilliant. It was really ro low res. It was... Um, double image so you were getting echoes of the initial image but i got past that and it, as i said it's not a film that requires you to have the most wonderful thing you know a resolution or, or anything in the world to, to make sure you understand it and you enjoy it more effectively true okay i think we've covered escape from cyberball now what are we doing next week so uh we are doing what i think is one of the best movies ever made on media and the movie that is very much of our times, despite the fact that it was made uh, well nearly 40 years ago. Um, it is the last movie Peter Sellers ever starred in. Uh, it was a passion project of his, and it's called Being There. Ah, you suggested this a long... Oh, you have mentioned it to me a long time ago, and I still haven't seen the full thing. I think you've sent me a few different scenes at times. So that'll be interesting to watch. Very, very cool. Okay. This has been the last edit. Now, don't forget that we are not only on YouTube now, we are on Spotify, we are on iTunes, we are on Anchor, we are on every audio thing you can want to possibly listen to us. And by all means, in the YouTube comments, talk to us about Escape from Sober War. Talk to us about the films that we've talked about in prior podcasts. What kind of stuff do you enjoy? What kind of weird, indie, oddball, unique, not-so-mainstream stuff would you like us to maybe cover in the future? We might possibly, possibly consider it. We can be kind on occasion. On okay, occasion. on occasion. Only on occasion. The best we can do. Right, thank you very, very much for watching. Come back next week for another Last Edit podcast, and we shall see you very soon. Take care.